All right. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Leah. <laughs> um, for people listening, my name is Leah Siepel and I run Crosscut Studio, which is a business that is in part inspired by Jesse Johnson, who I'm talking to today. Um, and Crosscut Studio collaborates with uh, businesses, NGOs, and creatives to make custom digital education products like courses, trainings, apps, really any shape that your content and your goals need to fit. And my guest today is Jesse Johnson, who is also an old friend and, and with whom my life has overlapped in really quite a wide variety of ways. Um, briefly, we have danced together in a modern dance improvisational form called Contact Improvisation for many years. We were both public school teachers in New York City at the same time. Educated, got our master's degrees, I think, in publicly funded programs in New York City, like really about the same time as well. Later lived together in a small community of about 10 people. And it was really at that time that I got the idea to start my own business. I don't even know if I've ever told you this because in the room, uh, in the other room of the apartment that we were sharing, there was an, an empty room and Jessie decided to rent the empty room for her office while she veered away from public teaching and, and public education. And I heard her on a daily and nightly basis kind of doing the work <laughs> of getting a business going and doing the, taking the brave steps of, quitting her job and saying like, well, I quit my job, this better work now, and talking to her coach, and the walls weren't very thick, so I, I probably oh, like heard enough, heard more than I should, but uh, it was very inspiring. Um, and she's just done phenomenally well and is an uh, incredibly innovative and inspirational thinker. Um, so Jesse, tell us a little bit about your business. Uh, that was literally <laughs> my favorite introduction I've ever experienced. <laughs> I love you so much. I'm so honored to be here. It's so fun to be like growing professionally, interpersonally, emotionally, spiritually together. Yeah. Um, and I just have to say right now that I, I literally trust you with my life. <laughs> there is no one I would rather collaborate with or refer to anyone who is working in digital education. So I just want to get that mm, like thank you. stamp of enthusiastic support out of the way. Um, <laughs> So my work is in supporting spiritual teachers and healers and transformational coaches in integrating money, real wealth, as a tool for liberation and service. So mm -hmm. most of my clients are very, very good at what they do. They're very, very masterful in their transformational work. I'm not particularly teaching them how to do that but they have not necessarily mastered money. And it, oftentimes they, they have an inner conflict that selling what they're doing is at somehow at odds with the service itself. Yeah. So I've been doing this since I started my business, which was almost five years ago. Hmm. Wow. But I know, shocking. Um, but it has really during COVID, since this pand this global pandemic kind of began, my conviction and inspiration for doing this work has really increased because I see the value of consciousness. I'm gonna give that the broadest term I can. Mindfulness and consciousness work is the most healing and empowering tool that people have right now. Mm -hmm. It is, it is sort of, I see it as the kind of the difference between those who are finding a way to make the best of this time mm -hmm. and those who are really struggling during this mm -hmm. time. It's, it's like, do they have spiritual technology available to them? Interesting. Mm -hmm. And in my, my, it's like, it's 2020 people have to understand money in order to operate in this society. There, yeah. there isn't really a way to exit from, from that truth at this time, for better or for worse. I'm not advocating for it one way or the other. And in order for people who have that level of spiritual mastery and purpose to be truly at service at the level that they're capable of, they have to be truly free around money. So that's my mission, that's my purpose, mm -hmm. and I love what mm -hmm. I do. And since I started that business in our apartment together, <laughs> uh, I have 
you know, built a huge team and served hundreds of people and made millions of dollars doing it and mm -hmm. am just like continuously showing myself and the people in my community mm -hmm. what it looks like for the more as possible principle to be true. Right, 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 totally. And you know, it's interesting, uh, as if this might just tur turn into a big love fest, but I'm gonna say this anyway, that you are one of the voices in my head. So mm -hmm. when I have, when I, you know, get confused around certain issues, around, you know, whether I should charge a certain amount who I should work with, whether I should do something I'm confused about or have mixed feelings about. I often pull the Jesse Johnson voice in and I, I think I've memorized your, the messages that are most relevant to me and I just, mm. I kind of play them over. So uh, it's, it, I mean, I haven't even worked with you individually in this way and I, it has, our, has helped me in so many ways. Um, what an honor. <laughs> I'll say one thing that's relevant to what you just mentioned, because I think we're all really grappling with COVID right now and what this means for our lives and our businesses and work. Um, and it, it, what you said relates to something I've been noticing and that I, in part, want to talk about today, which is that technology in education used to be kind of a bonus, right? You could use it or you could not use it. If you wanted to use it, it was usually because there was something particular you wanted to do that was kind of cool or like brought global audiences together. Or if you used it in the classroom, um, it was like a special day that you used that or perhaps there was a software system that you kept track of data on. Mm. And because we really haven't had to use it as our only option, I think uh, as a culture, as a country, um, maybe as a world, we haven't actually figured out how to best use technology. And now that the building of school is gone because we can't all be in a building because there's a health crisis, um, we are forced to look at technology and say, you're all I've got. And there's something creative about that. You know, mm -hmm. necessity is the mother of invention. And I see it happening. This is, this is a moment when it's really happening. And, and from my perspective, I'm really grateful for this because I don't have to sell it anymore. <laughs> you know? and instead of having the conversation around why it might be a good idea to create a digital education offering, instead I'm having the conversation, okay, these are ingredient, the ingredients we have. What do you care about? What is your purpose? What is the mission of your business? And how do we combine those and make something with those that is powerful and impacts people the way you want to impact people? Um, so it's a little bit like getting married. You like look at the person and you're like, you're all I got now. We got to make the best <laughs> of this that we can, right? It's like, we're like, now we're like married to technology and education and uh -huh. we are dealing with it and we're not all happy about it yet. Um, hmm. And so what I wanted to, oh, go ahead. I, hearing you is clarifying many things very quickly so i can't i can't speak as fast as it's coming in but one of the things that i i want to name is that th there's something about what you're pointing to that is the reason why i respect and trust you in the line of work that you are doing so uniquely i don't know anyone else who is i who i believe understands education mm -hmm. like really truly as well as the level of excellence that's possible with in any platform but particularly right. with digital technology mm -hmm. and when i was a teacher i was like i was on that kind of one foot my school had smart boards in every classroom by the time i left i don't think we did in the beginning but like we we had graphing calculators we had um trainings on other kinds of technologies which we may or may not have used mm -hmm. and the truth was it was all so shallow like it was like mm -hmm. here's this new shiny toy go use it but it was right. totally unclear how it was actually solving a problem that we had and so for me most often I just like I did the thing that was most authentic comfortable and clear to me right. and most of the time that did not require technology 
So I was old school in that way to a fault. I think that there were opportunities that I missed, but it was because there wasn't anyone like you really helping. I mean, also, let's just be honest, public school teachers have so much to do. Right. The capacity to like think about unnecessary things is sort of like, that right. doesn't Absolutely. happen necessarily. Absolutely. Um, but I feel like the thing that you, transitioning from educator space into entrepreneur space, I would say that that phenomenon is either equal or even more extreme, that entrepreneurs aren't necessarily educators. They certainly, in general, haven't spent a bunch of time in public school classrooms. They don't have the same background that I do. They're not thinking about education in the way that I do. And they're oftentimes, it's just a tool to, to I don't want to say that they're like selling out. That's not what I mean, but they're not necessarily thinking about the things that are necessary to think about when you're thinking about education, right? That, that's not their training. And so it, it's a, it's a gap that has been there for decades. And I feel like you have the freaking, all the balloon strings to actually get this thing on liftoff. Anyone that is considering doing any online training, any digital training, and actually having it make a difference hmm. needs you in their corner, period, the end, period. Thank the you, end. thank you. <laughs> you know why I, what I think is different about what I'm doing is that with technology and often with any kind of tool or, or, or um, even like activity that you might do in teaching, oftentimes people start with cool technology, start with a tool, start with an activity that's fun, and then kind of layer those upon each other with a vague idea of the purpose of what they're doing. And usually what the participant, the learner, the student experiences is actually those tools and the activities, but not the greater purpose, right? So what I'm doing is honing in on the purpose first and forgetting about all of the really thousands of tools that we could use to do anything online or in person. And once we're clear on that purpose, then going backwards and saying, what exists in this world that will support you in um, fulfilling that purpose? And then technology is actually, it's really not about digital learning in, its, in a way. It's just that digital learning exists amongst all of those possibilities. So you can look at Maybe the best thing is paper. There are situations in which that's absolutely the best thing. There are situations in which it's not at all the best thing. Something far more sophisticated technologically is the best thing, either because you're trying to reach a different audience or you're having a different kind of communication or you're trying to share the thing that you're making with learners in a very different kind of way. But that's why I, I, I try to keep in mind that what you want students to experience is the actual purpose, which is basically another way of saying impact like what is that impact you want to have and then make sure that the student is experiencing that not distracted by the tools so they don't finish a course saying I use this really kind of cool conversation tool they finish a course saying my life changed in x y and z ways <laughs> and now I'm able to do this thing that I wasn't able to do before the tool was a tool the tool isn't the purpose um, and I, I that's a mic drop moment. I just want to put big neon lights around <laughs> that. Like the tool is a tool, the tool is not the purpose. And I agree with you. And this actually is true about educators. I think that one of the reasons that I'm as good as I am at what I do is because of my training as an educator, which which forced me to ask this question over and over and over again. What is my purpose? What is the goal right. that I want to create here? Mm -hmm. Because I can't, I mean, you describe that thing of like here's a cool activity, let's do it, and then layer a bunch of them. I'm like, I did that every oh, day. Oh, of course, years. we all have, yeah. <laughs> right. right. And it was through the process of inquiry and studying what was working and what wasn't working that I got to see, like, oh, this is, this is actually really inefficient and often right. ineffective. Whoa, hi, helicopter. So, <laughs> emphasizing the truth of what I'm saying. <laughs> And this, this really brings me to a point and a slash a question that I wanted to pose to you or pose to us, um, which is, I think that, so the, the basic direction of any educational offering 
needs to start with purpose so that both the person who's the teacher or the coach or the master, or whatever that role is, knows what they're doing and why they're doing it, but also so that the learner who is signing up to give their precious time to this activity knows what they're signing up for. That's not usually how it is, right? Especially for kids, but, but for adults even in a continuing ed class or an internship. Oftentimes what we're going to get out of something is quite vague to us. Um, and it's usually because the people running the thing aren't clear themselves. So if the basic paradigm for learning is get clear on your purpose and then construct an experience, which can be more or less structured, sometimes the best way to lead to a purpose is to leave it somewhat unstructured or very unstructured because perhaps the purpose is learn to grapple with the unknown, learn to deal with uncertainty within a particular set of paradigms. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's a skill like you need to learn HTML, right? And so then your purpose is we want to get you fluent in this language. And so we're going to teach you and have you practice it in multiple scenarios and see how you do and give you feedback. That requires more structure. So I think what I'm looking at as we step back from this notion of education, which is so uh, linked to school in all of our minds that we almost can't think outside of it. Like we think education, we think school. Even if we're not thinking about mm -hmm. school, we, don't, we, we imagine education and learning happening in school, no matter what age we are. When we decide we wanna learn something, we recreate these spaces around ourselves, whether we're the teacher or we're the student. <laughs> and we build wa walls around ourselves. And that is what I see happening in this moment in which we're really you know, recreating education online. We're doing whatever we can to build familiar walls and containers around ourselves so that we feel safe doing the activity that we've done for years. Unfortunately, Fuck. instead of... <laughs> Instead of saying, wait, what is my purpose? Again, putting everything aside and saying, what is the purpose? What is the impact that I want to have on students? Do I need any kind of room-like container? Do I need any familiar sequencing of activities? How do I let all of that go so that I'm not just having this same conversation again, but in a new space? And the only reason I care about that is if you ask most people who've taken an online course, they have found it boring. They have found it flat. They've only gone through about 2% of the material offered. It hasn't changed their life or given them new skills. A few have, re sometimes really, really motivated, motivated learners can do this. Most people can't. And so we're putting all of this energy into creating things online, which at the moment is our only, one of our only forms of educating. And people are not inspired by the learning. <laughs> That wasn't a question, that was a manifesto, but if you have any responses, I'd love to hear them. I mean, the, one of the things that I will say, just to extend some mercy to all of us, is mm -hmm. that recreating something that we have a mental model for is an easier cognitive demand task yeah. Yeah. Then, answer, then asking and answering the kind of questions that you are posing. And I, I think that that's important to recognize that it's yeah. worth it. It's worth it to ask those questions and answer them. And, and to understand that part of the reason that we don't default to it is because it's hard. Like right. they're deep questions they're open-ended questions there isn't one right answer you can't measure if you've gotten the right answer yeah. it's like mm -hmm. it reminds me actually because I was I was one of those students in math class who could actually learn from the textbook for a long long time <laughs> that's amazing it's amazing I don't know why like I, I don't yeah. know if my my dad taught me how to do that somehow mm -hmm. or if I just inherited that genetically but like in fourth grade I I worked on my own in the back of the room in the textbook because I was bored. Right. And so I, so that is how I learn, but I right. experienced as a student and as a teacher that that is rare. Right. And what was working just to name it, the thing I was so good at was repeating the mo the steps 
that someone modeled for me. I was not thinking deeply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was really challenged when I got to a math class that I couldn't just repeat a method over and over again 50 times and get the right answers where the problems were more nuanced and there maybe it wasn't about the right answer it actually was about thinking i had to sort of start from scratch we're living in times where that paradigm of problem solving is more applicable it's more relevant it's a better description of what is actually required at this time yeah yeah Yeah. i think you could argue that that's always been true but for sure now Right. For sure now, anything that can be automated either is or is about to be. That is mm-hmm. no longer what human beings need to be doing. Right. The only thing we need to be doing is learning how to think, right. learning how to solve problems that don't have just one clear path. And so that, that also is a higher cognitive demand challenge as an educator right. than teaching someone how to solve two-step equations over and over again. It's like... Right. Teaching people how to think is a, how do you do that? Right, right, Yeah. right, exactly. And, and I think also, yeah, what has happened is, and knowing so many teachers of so many different kinds, I mean, March, April, May, June was a really, really challenging situation. And I, and, and even now, again, people were sort of thrust into this new school year without understanding what they were going to do until the last minute. And so this is not meant as a criticism. This is meant, um, as a hope for what we can now do faced with this reality that the pandemic is continuing. (laughs) It wasn't, the curve wasn't flattened in two weeks like we were told. (laughs) Um, So this is our new world for a while and we don't know what this world will evolve into. And um, so we're looking at this and I, I agree. How do we teach people to think is the question. Um, You're doing it. I'm doing, I'm doing it. Yeah. And I, I mean, I really love those moments when someone says, I want to teach something. I'm trying to fit it into to this framework. Uh, it's not fitting. Can we talk about how to do that? And sometimes it can end up that it should fit in that framework. It should look like a totally traditional course that meets the needs of certain learners who really want that and, and want to interact with something really predictable and easy to use and et cetera. I mean, everything should be easy to use, but you know, that, that is really recognizable. It's just that it's better to get there by first starting with purpose than it is to go to the structure and then hope that the purpose fits in the structure. Yes. So I'm, one of the questions I have for you is if we go with this, um, paradigm of purpose and then move backwards. In your work, helping people grapple with their own challenges and learn, I mean, your work is still really about learning, about teaching and learning and Mm -hmm. and about education, actually. Um, Coaching is about creating change in people. What are you noticing now that you're not a classroom teacher anymore? It's been a long time since you've been a classroom teacher. It's also, you were a coach for teachers for a while, but it's even been a while since you've been that. So what new observations do you have about the way people learn? When do they learn well in your world? When do they not learn well? Are there any elements you can pick out? Yes. I mean, this is, we, this is one of those topics that we could talk about for days and days and days. There's so much. <laughs> It's so rich and I'm continuing to study it. I think that um, one of the most foundational things that I know now is that as human beings, perhaps uniquely in, on planet Earth and or in the universe, we are, we are a part of nature and we are distinct in that we have the power to choose. Mm-hmm. It is what makes us so powerful. And also it's, it's complicated. Like we, we moment to moment can choose to change and grow mm-hmm. or not. Mm-hmm. I don't think anything else in nature can do that. Like nature just grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. Whether you're talking about dolphins or trees or microorganisms and, and then it dies. 
human beings can choose moment to moment. I want to grow or I don't want to grow. Right. Um, and so when we're talking about learning, what part of what I see is that the, like wh when you talk about change, transformation, these are, this is the same thing. Learning is change, is transformation, is growth. These are all synonyms in my mind. And it's been powerful for me to witness how true it is that we all have these kind of competing forces at work. The part of us that wants to grow and learn and evolve mm -hmm. and the part of us that is maybe connected to our reptilian brain that would prefer not to, that really would like, even if that means that we're suffering or struggling or miserable in some way, we have a tendency to choose not to change because it's uncomfortable and scary and mm -hmm. requires that we look mm -hmm. at the unknown, requires that we think, requires that we uh, do something that takes us out of our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And so it's been fascinating to do, like people pay me an enormous amount of money to help <laughs> them change. Right, right, right. And then huh. don't do the work. And I, not always, but like that a huge part of why they hire me is because yeah. they do that. Right. Right. Nobody needs me to teach them how to do something. To, I mean, a little bit. I do a little teaching, but mostly hmm. they need my help to help them get out of their own way and stop doing this reptilian thing huh. <laughs> so that they can actually let themselves expand and grow. Right. And it is, that is a fierce and very profound battle. I want to use the word battle. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah. So what makes, what's the difference like for people that choose in that moment that you're talking about to grow or not grow? I mean, what are the conditions mm -hmm. that might create a choice of growth versus a choice of not growing? There's a couple of things. One is desire. Mm -hmm. They have to want their business or their impact or their visibility or their book or their financial success more mm -hmm. than they want whatever they're currently experiencing. Right. Like percentage wise, maybe it's 51%. Like it doesn't have to be a lot, but it's not like what that looks like is pretty like, pretty determined, pretty yeah. willful, pretty like, it's hot. They're like, right. I want it to do and this. I want yeah. it now. Yeah. yeah. I also, part of what I find, at least in my clients and in myself, that also comes through there is a willingness to, or maybe even a preference to be guided by the divine or God or some, mm -hmm. something bigger than themselves. It's like, for me, I, I didn't have in my mind that I wanted a seven figure business yeah. when I was working in our apartment. Like I didn't, <laughs> I, that hadn't even occurred to me. Right. Um, I'd never seen that. I didn't know you could do that. Huh. It wasn't, yeah. that wasn't what was driving me, but I was dedicated to the vision that I was being given which really I feel was like a calling. Yeah. And yeah. pretty early on, I felt like, okay, I, I'm willing to say yes to my calling, no matter what, even mm -hmm. if it makes me uncomfortable, mm -hmm. even if it scares me, mm -hmm. even if not everybody understands it, even if not everybody likes it, I'm willing, mm -hmm. I, I care more about my devotion to God in that way. That's my right. language for it. Right. Not everybody, ha like, I think every human has that, actually. That's what purpose is. I think we all came here with that. But not yeah. everyone is is ready to be that full on. It's a right. little like being like Gandhi or Mother Teresa. Or, right. Uh, it's like, that's yeah. a big, it's a big decision. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. So you feel like desire and a sense of calling are the two main ingredients. So, yeah. so when you're charged with helping someone learn and grow, do you then work to increase their desire or increase their sense of calling? Mm. Or what do you do about that? Do you just say, listen, person X, you either gotta, <laughs> you know, or like, what's your, what yeah. do you do? How do you teach I, in this way? 
I will say that I think I do, I do teach on these subjects, but one of the big changes in my experience of my own identification as an educator is that when I was working in public schools, we were kind of forced together. Mm -hmm. I didn't choose my students and they didn't choose me. Right. They didn't even choose school half the time. Mm -hmm. um, that is the opposite now. And I will say that it's not that I, Right. It's not that I don't have a desire to work with someone who doesn't have that desire or calling, but it's just not cost effective. There's no reason for them to hire me right. if they don't kind of come with that already. And so I, I don't work with everyone. Right. Like I don't work with most people. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a huge paradigm shift from public right. school teaching right. Right. to, to running this business. Yeah. Um, hmm. So I think that once people hire me, then I can help them reconnect to their calling. I can remind them of their calling because they've mm -hmm. shared it with me. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can help them move through the mindset barriers that have them resisting their desire because a lot of us have been trained to want less and like disconnect from our desire. So I can give them tools for that. But they come to me with a pretty big bonfire already lit. Right, 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 right. Interesting. And this is, this is related, but a little bit of a sidebar, knowing that we don't have a ton of time left. I've really been wanting to ask you this question. Do you feel, so when you look at the, the addition of a digital tools and technologies that now exist, and you know, I know none of us know all the random tools that exist, but the sort of ability that is unprecedented to reach, to have our reach be very wide and to, mm. to um, connect in multiple ways with any given person and to create groups of all kinds online and just the power of the internet, basically. Are there ways that in the kind of teaching, coaching that you do that you feel like the internet itself is enabling a new kind of learning or growth? Oh, yes. Tell me about that. <laughs> I, I, I'm like, does anyone disagree with that? I can't even imagine. I, one of the things, I'll just share like a short story to illustrate my lens on this. Pretty early on in my work with entrepreneurs and spiritual teachers and healers, I started to see this connection of money mastery and financial freedom that really was at some level at the heart of why I think we were all teaching in New York City public schools. Like, I, I wasn't thinking about money so much, but I was thinking about opportunity. I was thinking about privilege. I was thinking about access. Mm -hmm. I was thinking mm -hmm. about like, how do I get my low income students to, right. to be able to do whatever I do? Yeah. And, and we talked, I mean, I think anyone, anyone who's been in public schools, I hope anywhere in the country, but for sure in New York City, knows a lot that there's trainings about all kinds of things in that yeah. domain. Um, when I, my experience was that it didn't work. Like poor kids mm -hmm. left poor kids, like graduated high school poor. And when on, like in general, class stayed the same. Yeah. So the fact that we were working actively to dismantle a cycle of poverty, I didn't really observe that that was changing. Right, right. At a system level, maybe yeah. there were exceptions, but at a system level, it wasn't, nothing was changing. When I started doing this work, my class changed. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And then I was like, uh, wait, 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 wait. This is different <laughs> than I thought it was. This change is not what I huh. understood. No wonder I couldn't do this when I was middle class and had always been middle class. How let could me, I teach? Let me ask you about that. So what had you been, the, what's the basic message that you've been teaching to students about how to change class that was, it didn't turn out to be true? Do like, good in school. <laughs> like do good in school, do your homework, do well, and then, right. And I will say the subtext, this is, this is not pretty, but I'm going to be real honest, like true confessions, the subtext of that, the unconscious communication there was be like me. Right. Right. Be, right. be middle-class and white like me. Right. That was the, that was the white supremacy trickling in. Right. And so that was the message. And what was actually the truth around how you changed your class? For me and for them, 
the truth is that changing class means risking leaving everyone that you love behind. Hmm. Because if your whole family is of that class right. and they aren't doing the work to change class, hmm. that change is going to affect everything. Wow. Changing class is tectonic shift level change. Fascinating. So it's like, people like to say that they want to have all kinds of money, but like they do not want to cut ties with the people that raise them. Right. And it's, it, it's not that you have to cut ties in order to make money, mm -hmm. but you got to be willing to face the possibility that those relationships are going to dramatically change because you are no longer sharing that very foundational experience of life. So fascinating. And who would choose that? Like randomly, certainly right. not at scale. Right. And then again, just to like throw myself under the bus in a, in a generous way, like why would they fucking want to be like me? <laughs> Instead of being like their family that understands them and has raised them and fed them and protected right. them and fought for right. them. Like that. So it's got to come, it's got to come from them. The desire to change has got to come from them. Hmm. It's irrelevant what I want for them. Right. It is irrelevant. Right. And what, when yeah. you think, this is, this is the tricky part of educating kids, because like, how do they know what they want when they're so young? There's, there yeah. is like a sweet spot, I think, of collaboration there where the adults in charge do kind of have to hold a vision for them while they're developing so that right. options are open to them. But it's tricky. It's real yeah. tricky. Yeah. So how do you feel like the internet has allowed for the ability or has enabled the ability to change class? So the, the little micro story that I was going to tell is that early on, I figured this out. I was like, okay, I know how to teach this now. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking about and talking to old connections that I had in New York City public schools. Like I want to do a workshop. I want to teach these mindset tech, like tools to these kids. Yeah. And I just, it like wasn't working just logistically. And I started to look at why it was like, yeah, when I was a teacher, mm -hmm. if I had thought about the impact of bringing a guest into my classroom for one hour or do mm -hmm. an after school program, like what are the chances of that being impactful long-term? Mm -hmm. Like inspirational, yes. But yeah. like really for them to learn and do the work, like not high on my right. ranking system. Right. And so then I started asking like, yeah, well, where, so then, and certainly not at scale, like maybe I could work with 30 kids at a time, mm -hmm. but I want to do system change. So mm -hmm. where, where else are teenagers hanging out on the <laughs> internet? <laughs> and where do they choose what yeah. they're looking at, what they're right. watching on right. YouTube, on TikTok, on Instagram? Yeah. yeah. So it was mm -hmm. a huge paradigm shift for me that mm -hmm. actually the mission that I've been on since I was, since I figured out that injustice was still happening and that I wanted to be of service yeah, is actually that the internet is the place where people have, and it's not perfect, mm -hmm. but they have more access mm -hmm. to information mm -hmm. and more freedom to choose what they consume. Mm -hmm. And that my job is to make the teachings available so that they can even learn that they exist. Right. And then they get to decide what they do with them. That's really interesting. So it's, it's really pure availability of information in that sense. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, now it is also super handy that my business has always been online. And so now during COVID it's business has just grown since COVID started. Right. Right. right, right. Um, I, in that way, I just think it's, it's an alternative platform. It's not necessarily better. Um, right. If I could see people in person, I, I might, really choose that a lot more often mm -hmm. but um but the fact that the internet can make so much available that right. just what right. you could not access before right absolutely yeah I and mean, part of why I ask and this is definitely could be a whole second conversation which I'd love to have is that I I'm part of this I think we many of us are conflicted about the internet we um we love it. We use it all the time. It's uh, made its way into really every aspect of our lives. Um, we know the power of it because our lives have changed so much because of it. Mm -hmm. And 
yet we're really conflicted about the way it's invaded every aspect of our lives. And we also know that it's complex because major corporations are creating algorithms and manipulating our behavior. And so that's true too. But I'm, I'm trying to get with people I'm in conversation with right now, I'm really trying to get at a sense of possibility around the internet because it is here to stay. It's probably going to involve, evolve into something else at some point. But right now, it's, it is a part of our lives and we can't live a life without it that's very expansive. And I feel um, that the best way to work with my clients is to get them to think in terms of possibility mm-hmm. around digital you know, offerings rather than like I've said, transferring what they know online or being fearful of going online, you know, to just frame yeah. the question over and over into what, what does the internet offer us? What kinds of learning and growth and change can occur because of these digital technologies? And, and let's focus on that. We're not abandoning in-person intimate situations. Those will continue. And those are wonderful. There's, you know, there's, it's not mm. to condemn them, but to reframe again towards positive outcomes that are newly possible. It reminds me of contact improvisation. I don't know how many Mm. of the people listening will have the experience to make the reference, but if Mm. we were in person, we could demonstrate leaning into each other, like back to back and gradually moving our feet away from one another Mm. until we were in a physical position kind of like this or or like this, right? Mm which is one, like if you remove, let's say this is me and this is Leah Mm -hmm. and Leah disappears. I can't stand up that way. Mm -hmm. I can only be in that position with someone supporting me. Right. And so contact is a form that's all about researching, like what can two bodies do together or more Mm -hmm. that one can't do? What, what, how does it change? And so I think that Mm. I just hear the, the sort Mm -hmm. of, very curious researchy possibility artistically researchy possibility yes. yeah. that you're you're holding and i'm i'm so with that i think in march we had a live retreat scheduled i think it was like the 15th and 16th and on i think the 14th we realized that la was about to get shut down mm-hmm. and it was irresponsible of us to have that event in person. Mm -hmm. And so in four hours, we pivoted the whole thing to virtual. And because of that short timeframe, I mostly, I mostly just did the same thing that I had been planning to do, Mm -hmm. but on zoom. But in the process, I realized there are things that we can do here on zoom Mm -hmm. that are impossible to do in the room. One of them is that I can have a computer in front of me. Mm-hmm. I would never have a computer in front of me if I was talking in, in a meditation studio to a group of people. Right. I would never have a laptop like this. Right. When I'm on Zoom, I can do that. And that means I can refer to all kinds of things. I can share right. my screen. I can share videos. Yeah. They can talk to me through the chat yeah. nonstop. Right. They can talk to each other through the chat nonstop. Now, for teenagers, that's maybe a distraction <laughs> for adults. I think it still needs to be monitored, but I find it really uh, enlivening. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. There's right. a kind of privacy that people get to feel when they are in their own homes. Yeah. There's a, it's different kind of intimacy. So I have been very actively studying mm. specifically in my virtual retreat context, what's possible here on zoom even with a group of, I mean, actually, even we just had this memorial for one of our teachers, Nancy, yeah. on Zoom. Hundreds of people from all over the world. That's right. one of the biggest things that's different is that people from all over the world right. can come to my headquarters and study right. together. Right. Uh, it's that's phenomenal. amazing. It's, <laughs> I, when, when have we ever been able to experience the whole reason that we even know that there's a global pandemic? in such large part is because of the internet. Right. right. Yeah, this, the pandemic sucks, but we are in it together. Yeah. I think that's very inspiring. Yeah, that is so inspiring. Right, and your, your metaphor, and after this I'll wind down because I know we're running out of time, but your metaphor of the people, me and you, reminds me or, or points to the fact that what we're talking about here is a relationship to the internet. 
Mm. So we're in relationship with the internet. This person mm. is in relationship to that person. And our relationship is full, very conflicted <laughs> and therefore distracting. And so, right, it's like what you're talking about right now is kind of improving wanna, that relationship. I know I'm interrupting you, but I'm just like, I don't, do you really feel conflicted about it? Is that true? Or you just perceive I feel that conflicted about it. I do feel conflicted. Huh. Um, I think probably more conflicted than you do because of the ways that it's combined my worlds that are uncomfortable for me. Um, and also, you know, having a child and putting that child on the internet sometimes and really thinking about whether or not that's a good thing to do, um, how that will impact him, what it means for his, his growth and development. I mean, these are conversations that are, I have daily about sure. various aspects of this. Yeah. Um, and that's okay to think about a relationship with something important daily, but you know, I think we yeah. should think about it, but, but I want it to be, I, I want to increasingly get the sense of possibility into the conversation and especially around learning. I think at large people are depressed about having to go online with learning right now. Like, yes, there's possibility. Yes. Some people are excited about it, but a lot of teachers who love the classroom, a lot of facilitators who love a room are upset, um, sure. completely understandably. But yeah, I think that energy is, is clearly felt to me. Sure. The, yeah, the change is real and there's loss with it. Yeah. So I, I don't mean to ignore that. Um, right. And I think what part of what I'm thinking about Gary Vee a lot as you talk about this, Gary Vee is a, a, a very prominent influencer on mm. all platforms. Mm. And he's, I mean, he, I guess he has a corporation, but he's not, he's not like uh, Facebook, right? right, he, right? He's a personality and he's got a big platform and mm -hmm. he is very powerful in his leadership, mm. in his innovation. And I think that what I'm, the reason I'm bringing him up is because he is, actively working to create culture around these platforms mm. and it's mm. working. Oh, that's amazing. And it makes me feel, I'm just, it's like, we have a couple of choices. We can sort of blindly follow what we're being yeah. spoon fed. I don't, that's not what you and I are doing. I don't mm -hmm. think anyone listening is doing that. Yeah. We can, we can get kind of bound up and resist because we don't like the complexity of it mm -hmm. and don't want to participate. I respect that choice and I discourage it at the same time. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, I don't think that there, we can't make a lot of change that way. Right. Like one of the best ways to let the, the, any, any problematic leadership continue to be in charge is to back out of the conversation. Right. Gary Vee is just an example of someone that I feel like is like refusing to back out of the conversation. He's like, not only am I going to sit at this table and talk about how we use this in a productive way, but mm -hmm. I'm going to use it differently than anyone's ever used it before. And it's mm -hmm. going to create a mass trend that uses it differently. Right. Wow. So I think as I listen mm -hmm. to you, I feel like as you talk about possibility, you're also talking about leadership. You're right. also talking mm -hmm. about, um, there's a word I'm looking for, sh like shepherding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like the, the people who have complex feelings about the internet, we need y'all more in this conversation. Right, less. right, right. Yeah, exactly. We need you using the internet more, not less. <laughs> Dig into the complexity, poke right. at it, talk right. about it, innovate around it, make it better. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that, that's what's going to change the tide. Right, and then create things that will set the tone for the next things that are created. Yep. I think we've solved it. Yeah, this is oh. it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Good. yep, that's why we're in charge. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jesse, um, I think you have to go, right? I do. Yeah. me up. All right. To be I continued. love you. To be continued. I love you so much. This we'll is super to... fun, super important. I'm super grateful for you. Thank you for talking with me. Um, actually, I'll just say before we go that I've been talking to some people who I'm interviewing for their knowledge. I'm talking to other people who I'm 
offering advice to. And it, as soon as I thought of you, I, I was like, it's just not going to fit in either of those categories. <laughs> just not how, it, <laughs> not how it's going to go down. So hashtag bitches in charge. <laughs> All right. Have a wonderful day. You too, Leah. Bye. Bye.